Here yeah, we go. Recording in progress. Yeah. Very okay. good. Okay. Uh, I'm Dr. Abraham uh, Weisfeld uh, of the uh, Jewish Socialist Bund, um, and I'm uh, a direct uh, link to the um, original uh, Jewish Bund by way of um, my family, which came from the Warsaw Ghetto. My mother was a Bundist member of the Jewish Bund, and her brother was a Jewish partisan who organized on the Grand Railway from Warsaw, the Warsaw Ghetto, into uh, into Russia to save as many women as possible to save the Jewish people by that way. And then he became a partisan with the uh, Nazi invasion of the Soviet Union and subsequently conscripted into the Red Army where he did his work and uh, then he was lost during that, that war. So uh, I'm speaking here on behalf of the Jewish Bund and our new organization at the website jewishsocialistbund.net. And uh, what's important to note here is our uh, compatibility with anarchism. And the anarchist principle of opposing the state per se as an authoritarian creature is uh, corresponds very well with the, the Jewish Bundist rejection of the state as the nation state, which caused such hell for the Jewish people in Europe and which is causing such hell for the Palestinian people in Palestine right now. The nation state is very problematic. Initially proposed in 1648 uh, by uh, Hegel, the Prussian philosopher, political philosopher, Hegel, who proposed that in the first place as a means to achieve uh, German democratic independence as a, as an independent state uh, from the Holy Roman Empire, etc. But uh, this liberal scheme um, degenerated into one war after another when each nation state, you know, sought the territory of every other nation state. What a mess Europe has made. And, and now they're trying to impose this nation state concept on the rest of the world? No way. The Zionists are totally out of historical uh, context. This is not 1648, basically. You know, it's as simple as that. And the uh, Zionist nation state cannot work and is showing itself to be, you know, worse than dysfunctional. It has become a fascist state. And this is recognized by many such people. The... Uh, The solution arises from the concept in anarchism that the state is not representative of the people. For instance, the Jewish people are a nation, but the Zionist state of Israel does not represent the Jewish people nation. We are a people nation, not a state nation. And this is ingrained in the in the uh, in the, in, the, in the writings of the prophet Samuel as well, who was opposing uh, the call for, uh, there was a populist call at the time uh, saying that the Jewish people should be a nation like other nations because they wanted to have a king. So, you know, Samuel said, no, you, you don't really need a king. You know, a king is just going to rip you off and send you to war. But the people, you know, insisted him. So he, this prophet Samuel, what he, he, he did a trick and he, he said, okay, you want a king? Okay, well, the son over there of the worker, whose name is Saul, he's going to be your king. <laughs> so he made this, you know, worker's son into a king, you know, just to ridicule the whole concept. And then Saul got carried away, turned into a dictator, was opposed by David. And then <clears throat> David, you know, was considered to be uh, having a blood on his hands and was not, you know, allowed, you know, to... Uh, build a temple as Solomon was. But Solomon himself, you know, had a multi, you know, national uh, court. He married, you know, uh, had many wives, you know, from different nations. And uh, it wasn't, you know, the uh, national chauvinism of Zionism uh, that they would uh, claim it was to be. So all of that, you know, has to be taken into consideration to prove that Zionism is not representative of the Jewish people and that Israel does not speak for the Jewish people. An empirical proof is that, you know, uh, a majority of the Jew Jewish people do not live in the Zionist state, do not want to live in the Zionist state. 
even if there's anti-Semitism, because the solution to the anti-Semitism is Antifa. You got to fight anti-Semitism where it arises and you don't run away, you know, like the Zionists did, you know, in the Second World War. When the Zionists, you know, came up to me at the vigil that I conducted at the Jewish community campus here in Montreal, it starts, you know, saying that uh, Israel is protecting the Jewish people. I said, oh, oh, oh yeah, how? The Zionists were the ones who ran away from the fascists in Europe, whereas the Jewish Bund were the ones who stayed and fought and won eventually. You know, even before the Red Army was allowed to fight against the Nazis by the Stalin-Hitler Pact, the Jewish Bund, you know, was fighting there as partisans. They formed the a, a, a Jewish Committee Against Fascism. And unfortunately, the bureaucracy there, you know, put all of those uh, members into prison or killed them, replaced by Jewish communists who were previously Jewish Bundists, you know, who were forced to resign from the Jewish Bund in order to become a member as an individual of the Communist Party. They were the ones who took over the Jewish Committee Against Fascism that was founded initially by the Jewish Bund. And then later on, they were purged again, you know, because they weren't uh, homogeneous. <laughs> so, you know, the Communist Party did not provide an adequate solution for, for Jewish identity. And in fact, they initially supported Zionism. It was the USSR who made the difference and voted for the recognition of Israel in 1948, in spite of the fact that it had gone beyond the frontier set by the partition plan of 1947. So, you know, the Communist Party has failed to deal with Jewish identity, failed to deal with Zionism, and has failed the Palestinians. And now is trying to make up for it since 67 and has turned anti-Zionist, but only to the extent of calling for a two-state solution. And then when the Communist Party fell apart and the members left, these uh, ex-Communist Party's uh, members, you know, resorted to calling for a one-state solution, which is not a solution either, because it doesn't account for the return of the refugees. I mean, you know, they can say, you know, that one-state solution would be democratic and everybody would have equal rights, and so nobody would object to the return of the refugees. But, you know, imagine, you know, a right-of-return law that was being uh, uh, proposed for adoption. You know, let's say there was an election. You know, one party, you know, in favor of the right of return, another group, you know, opposed to the right of return because it would make the uh, the Hebrews there a minority, minority nationality, which they have a great fear of. Okay, because they would be outvoted in every instance, you know. But how would they even, you know, vote to determine, you know, what to do with the Palestinian refugees? You know, it doesn't work because what is, what are they supposed to say? You know, 50 plus one vote, you know, is deciding you know, vote and to be treated as if it was unanimous decision. You know, this, this liberal democracy, you know, that they're flogging, you know, it's just a prelude to a civil war. That's all it is. Because, you know, if it was set up like that, one state with one person, one vote, you know, then <clears throat> the Hebrews there, they would uh, object, you know, to uh, any increase in the Palestinian population because they know that that would turn them into minority nationality and they would not tolerate that. So it doesn't work. However, if you take a no-state solution in which you have a federation, not a confederation, but a federation, okay? And uh, Pudom referred to a federation of federations. I love that phrase. I love it. But he just put the phrase out. He didn't elaborate, you know, like he didn't have time to elaborate it or context, you know? And the only sort of example that he could provide in anarchist theory was... Um, was uh, Switzerland or Belgium, you know, in which there was, you know, more than one nationality, you know, sharing the same state or sharing the same country. But those are territorially separated nationalities in which they form a confederation, like Canada is a federation. Quebec is a territory, and then the rest of Canada is English controlled. And, and so it's territorially divided. And people in Toronto never come to visit Montreal. <laughs> you know, I'll tell you, I'm from Toronto. And I am I think I'm the only one from Toronto who ever moved to Montreal. It's that much of a division. So it's, it's not, you know, adequate. I mean, there's concessions made to Quebec autonomy, like in pension plan, 
that sort of thing. But, <clears throat> and in uh, healthcare, okay. But I mean, it's just not adequate. So what the proposal that I have made in <clears throat> my book, The Federation of Palestinian and Hebrew Nations, is that there would be a real federation in which uh, each nation would have their own autonomous existence. Okay, this is an anarchist principle of autonomy. And now, how would this be implemented? They would have their own parliament for their own people, their own vote, their own majority. They could never become a minority. Okay, they'd have their own schools, their own language, their own religious institutions, you know, this sort of thing. And then it wouldn't matter where they were living. You know, it's not a territorial question. It's a matter of people, you know, so these people would have their own sort of political national culture so they wouldn't have any reason to fear then they would have their own police as well for security and then palestinians would have the same and then there would be a federal council to decide on constitutional matters and any modifications of the constitution to be held a permanent constitutional assembly for direct democracy which is another anarchist principle hmm? now <clears throat> this direct democracy Previously, it was defined in liberal terms in which, you know, each individual would have, you know, their 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 uh, vote in whatever sort of uh, institution they were to be found. But that's not enough. And when I was working together with uh, the Green Revolution of uh, of the Jamaria in Libya, I was, in, I was basically the uh, North American organizer, and I was invited to speak at a conference in Caracas, Venezuela, when there was a conference uh, on direct democracy that uh, set up the link between Libya and and uh, Chavez's, you know, Venezuelan, uh, Bolivian, Bolivarian revolution. <laughs> okay, so there I made a presentation uh, on uh, direct democracy, but in order to recognize the minority nationalities, which there are the, all the indigenous nations of, uh, of Central and South America, uh, I proposed that it be changed to direct and parallel democracy. And this was accepted by the Jamaria. It was accepted by Gaddafi. And I proposed this, and I, I made the speech to that effect, you know, at the Conference of Caracas. And the minority national uh, representatives of the indigenous nations came up and, and congratulated me because it was translated into uh, Spanish uh, by, the, uh, you know, by the conference. It was a great success. And then, unfortunately, in 2011, <laughs> The, you know, uh, France started the bombardment of Libya. You know, the United States joined in because they had a resolution from Security Council saying that there was to be a no-fly zone in Libya to protect the population supposedly from a supposed genocidal attack. But that didn't happen. <clears throat> but what did happen is that Libya infrastructure and defenses were destroyed by the imperialist powers. So... The concept of a direct and parallel democracy didn't go any further than that, but it was enunciated and it is, uh, you know, written up uh, uh, on uh, my uh, account at academia.edu, where that paper is presented. In addition to the 1973 paper that I made in Tripoli uh, on uh, Jewish uh, anti-Zionism, which was uh, elaborated by uh, Sayyid al-Islam al-Qaddafi, the son of Qaddafi, into the um, White Book uh, or the Israel Time uh, proposal, which was for basically uh, some kind of a, a joint society. But it was never very well defined. It was defined as a, a binational state in that work. But it wasn't very well elaborated. But what that work of uh, Qaddafi uh, does do that was uh, original is that it went through a history of all the binational proposals, which lent it credence and legitimacy as a concept. So Libya was a great source of inf of uh, new ideas, but uh, it uh, failed uh, for for two reasons. One, <clears throat> Gaddafi was trying to compromise and make a deal with the West. Uh, to uh, to uh, break the isolation and the embargo on the country. And initially, it was uh, successful because I even attended the conference at uh, Cornell University in which there was recognition of Libya by the United States of America when uh, 
when Gaddafi gave up uh, the nuclear program that they had begun there. And uh, and this was a gesture that was reciprocated by the United States. But then they destroyed Libya in any case afterwards. You know, so any any sort of, you know, promise made by the United States of America is good for nothing. And that proves it. So right now, you know, the uh, concept of uh, no state solution has, you know, the, the logic of it, you know, has had a tremendous impact. And here is a book by Daniel Boyarin, Professor Boyarin, called The No State Solution. <laughs> I mean, it's right there in the title. You know, this, this is, you know, like totally, you know, like break from liberal and, and uh, Marxist theory. In, with respect to the state. This is the no state solution. And it's published by, you know, I must note this for those who would question legitimacy. Let's see now. Uh, here it is. Right here. It says Yale University Press. Yale University Press. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, you know, this is top of top and publishes the No State Solution. A Jewish Manifesto subtitle. Excellent. And in the introduction, he refers to the Yiddish Socialist Bund. You know, this is the way to go. You know, it's the only logical way to go. And, uh, and so I would like to uh, make reference to anarchism as a source of inspiration. In addition to the class struggle, you know, theories of, of, of various sorts, both socialist and communist. But anarchism has a critique of the class structure as well and notes that the state upholds the class structure. So it's all related. There is no reason to have sectarian divisions between the various progressives. I mean, various uh, political tendencies have their specializations and can contribute by way of those specializations in their own political theory because 